Well, ladies and gentlemen, it falls to me to um, share the last session um, in today's uh, talks in honour of Professor John Wells. And uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce that promising young lecturer, <laughs> <laughs> Professor John Wells. Thank you very much. I feel sort of overwhelmed. It's been a most interesting day, and it's been absolutely fascinating to hear from my former students and colleagues about all these things I'm alleged to have done or said over the years, which I, on the whole, quite forgotten about. But there we are. I look back to the person who first taught me phonetics, which is John Tripp. I went to Cambridge reading classics as a sort of automatic consequence of what I'd had to do at school. And uh, I discovered phonetics really while I was there. Trim was on his own as the only lecturer in this subject. It wasn't examined, it was an optional thing. I mean, taught, if you believe, on Saturday mornings. Uh, so he had to be fitted in, but I found it absolutely fascinating and was sure that that's what I wanted to do. Looking back at my diaries for 1960, when I was, you know, in my last year at Cambridge, I find that very interesting entry in phonetic symbols. <laughs> uh, for those of you who are sort of new to the subject, those are some of the old click symbols in and amongst other things there. It says, of course, game to invest. <laughs> words to that effect. Trim had given us an exercise. Instead of him dictating to us for air training, those of us in the class had to invent a nonsense word to dictate to everybody else. Very good. Modern way to teach people, but to make us do it. And that was the word I decided to attempt. Uh, putting in it, as you can see, everything we've been taught cardinal vowels, implosives, nasalized clicks, tones, ejectives, voiceless f, and so on. The other uh, written in English entries are interesting too, aren't they? Minus x compared with minus sex, and sibling compared with quibbling showing that even then I was fascinated by, yes, Jones's juncture, Trim referred me to Jones's article on the subject that Ben talked about a few minutes ago, and this question of syllabic, well, non-syllabic versus syllabic L, as exemplified in that near minimal pair. Well, as Ben also told you, I did meet Daniel Jones, and three of us in the room, is it now, who met him, an ever-diminishing band, I describe this in my uh, sort of personal history, my little autobiography, which you can find on the web. Jones was, yes, very old when I met him. And what really I remember about him is how he didn't have any of the ordinary conversational chit-chat or small talk that you expect from somebody. I mean, he was entirely polite and so on, but when I got to his house at Jared's Cross, he sat me down and he made me do some phonetics, read to him from a phonetic text of Hindustani. And uh, really, I think it was a kind of, yes, test. He wanted to make sure that this new person that they have gone and appointed at UCL uh, will be able to do all the right things. So could I <coughs> control aspiration? Could I distinguish between dental and retroflex? Could I do all, make nasalized vowels, A, all monophones, and so on, that you have to do in Hindi? And once I had shown that I could, then he was prepared to talk to me, as it were, as an equal. So that was a, a memorable thing. The other people who taught me at Juicy Other Course were particularly Gim and Doc, A.C. Gibson and J.D. O'Connor. And I learnt all that I know, really, from them. And I well remember going for supervision with O'Connor, where we did indeed do nonsense words with O'Connor. And uh, as I came out from my session with O'Connor, the undergraduate sitting there outside on a chair waiting to go in was David Crystal from the English <laughs> department. <laughs> Heroic days. I was chatting the other day to a former lecturer in the Department of Scandinavian Languages, lecturer in Swedish, Karen Pellerin. And she said, oh, I always think of you as the baby of the phonetics department. <laughs> you can see that she's been retired some time. I couldn't find the picture of the phonetics department when I first came to it in 1960. 
But I did find this photograph from the summer course in 1947. And you can see there, uh, ranged across... Uh, Peter, let's see if I can make Michael's mouse work. Yes. No, no, we don't want that, do we? All right. Peter Denish there. Olive Tooley, that's what we've talked about. Gibson, looking rather younger, with a widow's peak he had when young. Uh, Hélène Cousnoble, who taught me French phonetics and reduced everybody in the class to tears by her <laughs> dragon-like behaviour. No, no, no. <laughs> so at least that's given me a very strong internal monitor of my pronunciation of French. Result, I don't open my mouth in French. Uh, there's Daniel Jones. There, I, I don't know who that is. It might be Parky or it might be, uh, perhaps maybe you can tell us. Yes, his secretary at the time. There's uh, Julian Prane. Whoops, yes. And then Marguerite Chapala, la jeune fille, mm -hmm. uh, the girl who gave us practice, practical practice in French pronunciation, and a very youthful James O'Connor. Okay. One big difference between then and now concerns formality and informality. Not only was I addressed as Wells, but I had to address my students as Mr. Smith, Miss Eccles, whatever it might be. Everybody was Mr. or Miss. No use of first names. That came in later. Gim and Doc, of course, had their nicknames, so we called them by those names. I mean, after we got over calling them uh, Mr. Gibson and Mr. O'Connor, they weren't then professor. Prim was the only member of staff who continued throughout his career until he retired to address me only as Wells. Uh, others were more flexible and started adopting the new modes of address when they came in in the 1960s with the student re revolution. And of course, we started calling the students by their first names, and then, horror of horrors, they started calling us by our first names. <laughs> then that became terribly old hat, and they went back to being more formal again, and we had a kind of pendulum going one way or the other. The other thing I wanted to mention about formality and informality, though, concerns job applications. When I was near the end of my master's course, two-year master's course in those days, I haven't got any very firm plans for what I would do next. Fry said to me, Professor Fry said to me, uh, oh, by the way, uh, don't worry too much about looking for a salary for next year. I think we might be able to do something if you're interested. So I said, oh, well, yes, I might be interested. And in due course, I got a letter offering me the job of assistant lecturer. Job interview? No. <laughs> Require a PhD? No. Have to demonstrate a research track record? No. Nothing like that. All done in a very informal way. Quite unthinkable today. <laughs> Looking back to that period, what I realised is how good I was at learning things fast. A skill which has sort of departed me now. When I was a teenager, you know, I taught myself shorthand. I taught myself to play the melodeon. Good at it. Uh, Spanish, I can well sort of say a few things. Italian, I can say a few things. I taught myself Esperanto as a teenager very thoroughly, and I can still speak that very fluently. But I wish I'd done more languages. I wish I could do more than just decipher books in Russian. I, I can, yes, read a book if necessary, looking things up, but I can't speak Russian. I know a few phrases in Polish. I wish I could speak a little more. I've been trying to learn some Japanese writing to learn hiragana and katakana, which every Japanese child knows by the age of eight. It's hard work getting it into one's head. As for kanji, which Japanese secondary school children learn 2,000 of by the time they leave school, I think I'm just too old for it. So, my advice to the young is learn while you can, because you won't be able to do it so easily in later life. Here's a picture from the International Congress of Phonetic Sciences in Montreal, 1971, to which I went with my colleague Evelyn Abberton. And I remember, amongst other things, that was the first time we had credit cards. And we took these exciting new credit card things abroad to see if they really did work in foreign countries. <laughs> That's a blog from the middle of that picture. Can you see anybody you recognize? 
that's, that's, that's me. So there's Klaus Kohler, there's Arthur Abramson, there's Asher Laufer, um, there is Lee Liska, there is Dennis Fry, there is Hans Tillmann, There's even more of a blow up for me, so that's what I looked like. Well, not in 62 when I was appointed, but in 71. Uh, well, I've got less hair nowadays, certainly, haven't I? There have been a lot of changes, really, over those 40 odd years that I've been here. From 1960, postgraduate, from 1962, on the academic staff. Tape recording. Now, I was always interested, of course, in sound, so. I owned a tape recorder. Peter Dennis said to me, what on earth do you want a tape recorder for? You're no good at experimental phonetics. What other use could it have? But yes, I took it with me doing my field work in the mid-60s to Jamaica when I recorded, amongst other things, the story of Sydney Villa. Uh, and, um, of course, I did it on a tape recorder, but they were not uh, things that were very advanced in those days. If you wanted to make spectrograms, which I did for my MA, dissertation, then you had to use a sonograph, and four seconds was the maximum amount of time you could have, and it took about an hour to analyze that with the whole thing going, cranking round and round and round, and using special, special teledeltos paper as it gradually. Nowadays, of course, you just press a button on a, well, don't even press a button on a, on a computer, and it's there immediately in front of you. To do the statistics for my PhD thesis, I had to use a mechanical calculator, of course, for you know, calculating statistical probabilities, you have to do sums of squares and square roots of that to get standard deviations. It took hours, but at least I had this mechanical electrical calculator clattering away, producing these uh, sounds. So it's much easier nowadays again when you do it electronically. Nowadays we have lectures with handouts, absolutely as the norm. It was a lot of work to produce a handout in those days. You had to type uh, a wax stencil, especially turning off the ribbon on your typewriter so that it didn't bring the ribbon up, but just cut a hole in the wax. And special correcting fluid you had to paint on whenever you made a mistake so that you could <coughs> correct it. Oh, well, that was a lot of work. You had to think at least three days in advance, not about 20 minutes in advance. <laughs> <laughs> that gave way to Xeroxing, which was a great boon because that was fast, so that once you could produce a decent original. Uh, how could you produce a decent original? Well, I had one of those old typewriters. We had one in the department that had phonetic symbols on, but they were very exotic and very expensive beasts, of course. That gave way to dot matrix printing, when at last we could control the characters that we had with our computers. <coughs> now we have inkjet printing and everything is easy. Slides, glass slides, or innovations of uh, other materials, they finally gave way to overhead projection, which some of us are still using, and that in turn has given way to PowerPoint, which is what you see in front of you now, which is such that since Val suggested this morning that I say a word or two about Esperanto, I quickly changed my PowerPoint presentation that I did last night, and now it's, going, it's got this in, and we can see it in a minute. Blackboards have given way to whiteboards, and indeed to interactive whiteboards. There's one of those old typewriters. Uh, you can't see from here that it's a 13 one, but it is. In 1984, there was no estuary English. Well, I forget why I chose the date, 1984. Right? <coughs> Anyhow, 22 years ago, something must have happened there. Um, there was uh, nothing for me to mention in my 1982 book about English accents, about estuary English, because the term hadn't been invented. Um, that's actually why I put 84, because it's new, it wasn't there of course, by David Rosewall. Now, uh, Joanna has successfully exploded it. Uh, maybe we can gradually forget about it. Other things that there were 20, 30 years ago, no World Wide Web, of course, no Google to look up anything quickly, to quickly find how many people use this or that expression. You can now get instant access to a, the biggest corpus that you could want in the World Wide Web. No Wikipedia to check out what something means. The trouble about Wikipedia, of course, is it's written by its users, which is us, and sometimes it's not all that accurate. 
Uh, the first entries on Scouse, for example, were full of nonsense, and uh, I had to tell my students to disregard it entirely. No email. How could we live without email nowadays? Do you remember writing letters? Oh dear, typing them, finding an envelope, and finding a stamp. What a business. No mo mobile phones, no texting one another, no word processing. My first interaction with computers, I didn't really get in on this early, which of course the department did with many computers and so on. My first interest was the little Sinclair ZX81, which was available to the general public, and enabled one to teach oneself programming, essentially. And that, and that was something that was really very useful that I learned from that. I must say the maths I did at school was good too. Although it had no practical application in those days, we did learn about binary notation. We did learn about hexadecimal notation. So when I come, came to want to program a printer, uh, what, 15 years ago, uh, with phonetic characters, I knew about hex and I could create the code to feed into it. And that was great. And now when we write web pages, again, that I understand what a variable is. I understand about hex notation for Unicode and so on, so that's fine. I thought I ought to acknowledge my publishers. Uh, the first publisher was Teach Yourself Books, with yes, the Esperanto Dictionary, we'll come to him in a minute. Pittman, who published Practical Phonetics. Blackwell, who published my PhD thesis about Jamaican. CUP, Cambridge University Press, who did my Accents three volume book, which established my scholarly name, I suppose we can say. And Longman, who did the EPD, which established my name in EFL circles. And I want especially to thank Longman. There's a picture of Della Summers, my constant contact at Longman, who took me to lunch way back and said, how about writing a pronunciation dictionary as a rival to the Daniel Jones one? And I said, what a good idea. And, <laughs> and I did. So thank you to Della for that idea. Yes, and uh, go back to Cambridge for the intonation book, which uh, is out shortly. We had hoped it might be out in time for now, but it isn't going to be out for a few weeks yet, it seems. Uh, I've got a little bit of research to report, so I'm going to do it very, very fast. I thought I'd have a look and see what actually happens in an examination when we examine people about intonation. These were native speakers of English, where the, what they have to do is they're given a sentence which they have to say aloud any way they like, and then describe the intonation pattern they used. Then the examiner gives a different version, and they have to describe what the examiner has done. So, if you had the sentence, he is going to donate it to charity, as it is in a monotone, you might produce any of these possibilities. I'll just go through them. Those of you who know about this will know it. The others, just to remind you, he's going to donate it to charity. 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 There was a, a range of the possible things you could do. Well, there were 19 candidates. They scored five on their own, five on the examiners, and their average score over all of this was sort of 52. The range was from 25 to 100%. This is like maths. You can score 100% if you're getting perfect. So seven of these 19 people failed, scoring less than 40, 12 of them passed, and five of them got more than 70. Now, what I looked at was the correlation that might exist between the candidate's own production and their success in describing it. And one of the things that they have control over is how many intonation phrases, how many IPs, to break it into. And I found very clear evidence, as you can see here, that those who chose to break it into two or more IPs scored worse than those who put it in a single IP. This, of course, is because they give themselves a more difficult task of description. If you have a single IP, there's a single nucleus with a single tone and a single head pattern and a single this and that around it. If you do it as two IPs, then you've got to double up on all of that. If you do three of them, you've got three. And even if you get one right, you've got, you fail to do the others. On the other hand, there was no correlation between where they put the nucleus and their score, no correlation between the choice of tone and their score. So my advice to candidates out of all of this is to keep it natural and keep it simple. People who fail, typically what they do is they say, I'm going to put the nucleus on that word at the beginning. I shall say, he's going 
to give it to charity. But then because they're in a context where to give it to charity is not actually given by the context, their knowledge of the language overwhelms them and they say he's going to give it to charity because they know they've got to still put an accent on the last new item and they fail to recognise it and fail to describe it, I think. Right, future plans. I divide uh, retiring professors' future plans into two models, which I call the O'Connor model. <laughs> now, when O'Connor retired, he said, that's it with phonetics. From now on, I'm just going to play cricket. <laughs> and he did. That's one model. The other I call the Ladifoget Quirk Cahoon model. Uh, some of you will know these three, some of you may not. Ladifoget, famous phonetician, of course, recently died, working right up to the end, brilliantly and very energetically. Randolph Quirk, grammarian, exactly the same thing. Still alive, still working. Uh, Cahoon, I saw at lunchtime when I asked his permission to use his photograph. A uh, retired professor of pharmacology at UCL, comes in every day, busy applying for research grants, working away 10 years into retirement. So the two models are, have nothing more to do with it and have a great deal more to do with it. And I want to achieve a middle way <laughs> to the extremes. Because I think I'd be bored if I didn't do any more phonetics. Anyhow, I'm fascinated, fascinated with phonetics and interested in phonetics. On the other hand, it would be a great relief not to have to come in at particular times and you know, teach when I'm required to rather than when I feel like it, and not to have to do marking and all the other chores, administration, that go with being fully employed. So, yeah, there's the Esperanto dictionary. These are some other things I've done. I started Esperanto when I was a teenager, and my Esperanto dictionary was in fact the first published book that I ever had. And that's really why my PhD was sort of a bit delayed, because I was busy writing that book. But it was a very interesting book to produce, because it involved me in comparing uh, bilingual dictionaries across languages uh, to see you know, what the Esperanto French dictionary says, what the Esperanto German dictionary says, what the Esperanto Russian dictionary says and compare that with the monoglot Esperanto dictionaries and looking at the evidence of usage and so on, putting it all together. I wrote the Linguisticae Aspectoid Esperanto, which is a linguistic description of uh, this and that in Esperanto, which has been pretty successful. It's been translated into various languages, but I never were around to translating it into English, so I'm very sorry about that linguistic aspect of Esperanto. Another dictionary I did is this uh, going idea Esperanto Kimra Vortaro, which is a bilingual Welsh Esperanto dictionary. I'm not sure about that. <coughs> concise one, but it also has a description of Welsh in Esperanto and a description of Esperanto in Welsh, both of which are written by me in the case of the Welsh with a little help or checking from native speakers because it would be a bit foolhardy to try it otherwise. But anyhow, that was great fun. And uh, that's perhaps the most exciting thing that came to me through Esperanto. At the time when I was the president of the Universal Esperanto Asocio, uh, our congress was in Havana, and so I did indeed, indeed get to meet Fidel, who is an absolute charmer, by the way. I mean, you can see he, he charmed everybody off their feet. And among our, the, the 200 people who were invited to the presidential palace, uh, we had uh, a bilingual family, well, not a multilingual family, in fact, with a, I think it was a Spanish father and a Vietnamese mother who used Esperanto in the home to bring up their children. And Fidel honed in on them and wanted, was very interested in this multiracial family and talking about, about this with them. And he, de he declared, me estas soldado de Esperanto, I'm a soldier of Esperanto, which uh, is the sort of thing that politicians say. <laughs> right, serious future plans. Well, my next. Uh, bit of work, I'm afraid, is in September when I have to go to Poznan to teach phonetics to an Esperanto medium master's course at the University of Poznan. So that's a few days in September. I may go back to Poznan as I do from time to time for the Poznan Linguistic Meeting, the next one of which is in April 2007, I think. I'm otherwise booked to go to Hong Kong in October 2006 and Japan twice in 2007, and I'm open to any further invitations <laughs> anybody might have to go to interesting places around the world. Apart from that, I plan longer and more frequent holidays 
in Montserrat and elsewhere. And I hope that will be part of the future for me looking like that. So thank you to all of you. Uh, I've had a wonderful job, a wonderful career, in a marvellous working environment, doing a job I really enjoy. And thank you for today's event to uh, Val, Hazan, and to all my colleagues and all today's speakers, and to you, the audience. Thank you all very much. that every now and again I had native speakers of Welsh in my class, and I felt so ignorant. And in fact, when I was uh, an undergraduate at Cambridge, in the six of us who chose a language option for classics, there was one native Welsh speaker from whom I collected Welsh examples to quote, you know, regurgitate in the comparative philology paper. And then, when I was here, I don't remember as a postgraduate or as a junior assistant lecturer, we had a Dr. Kenwen Thomas, who was a native Welsh speaker, and she and David Crystal, also a postgraduate, would have conversations in Welsh in the postgraduate room. And I felt frustrated that I couldn't understand them. So after a bit, all this frustration got too much, so I went to evening classes in London and uh, learned Welsh. And as you know, with any language learning, basically you have to teach it yourself. But the teacher is a very useful resource person to keep you on the right track and to uh, help you. So that's what I did. My first Welsh teacher in London, fortunately, came from uh, sort of uh, I think it was somewhere in South Wales, so I had a quite a South Welsh pronunciation. But the next more advanced teacher came from Shirvorn, from Anglesey, and he was appalled with his awful South Welsh pronunciation. And so instead of saying uh, tea for house, we had to learn to say tea, and instead of saying uh, brunt for the we had to say budur. And so on. So I learned North Welsh as well. So I've been sort of schizophrenic. I can understand the problem of the Japanese and Koreans who don't know whether to be English or American. I don't know whether to be North Welsh or South. And I end up somewhere in the middle. And um, well, I sort of did it up to age, you know, so I can have a reasonable conversation in Welsh. And what I've found with native speakers who wonder, well, where are where you come from? They think I might be perhaps from Argentina. <laughs> where you have these Welsh speakers who are neither from North Wales or from South Wales. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. One more question? Yes, Mike. John, when you did classics at school and later at university, did you ever wonder about the pronunciation of Latin in Greek? Not yes. until I came to Cambridge. And there it was Sydney Allen. Yes, who put on vowel diagrams for Latin and Greek, in fact, made us construct a vowel diagram for Latin and Greek, talked about phonemes and allophones, you know, as applied to Latin and Greek. It was an absolute you know, revelation because, of course, until then it had been entirely written languages for me. Uh, yes, Sidney Allen was the person who revealed all that, and uh, he was a great pioneer. You will know his books, Vox Latina and Vox Graeca, in which he does his best to reconstruct the pronunciation of classical Latin and classical Greek. Okay, yeah, one more short question. Um, who had their hand up in the middle there? Was it you? Do you still play the world? Do I still play the melodic? Well, I'm very out of practice, which is why I haven't brought it to perform here. Uh, in my sort of 30s, I used to play in a country dance band regularly on Saturday evenings, you know, semi-professionally. Uh, so I, you know, I can play reasonably well, but I really haven't practiced it for 20 years, more than 20 years, so uh, it would be nice to take it up. Perhaps that's one of my projects for retirement. Thank you very much, John. Can we have another quick round of applause?